Hello and welcome to another episode of the Hoppy Craftsman. I'm Jeff. I'm not Nate or Chris. We're here with Ed, the officially unofficial yeah, fourth Hoppy Craftsman. And we're here again with Rob Fulmer from the Arizona Craft Brewers Guild. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. So, we have another Real Wild and Woody coming up. So, uh, it's time to sit down and talk about happenings with Real Wild and Woody. Um, give us a little rundown about uh, those of our listeners who don't know what Real Wild and Woody is. Let sure. us know what it is. A little something that we threw together. Real meaning cask ale. Cask ale carbonated with unfermented beer uh, and put into a firkin or... Uh, some other vessel and the carbonation naturally occurs and, and it's a little softer carbonation generally speaking in, in England it would be lower alcohol but you know in the United States we do what we want it's also a great way for a brewery to let a cellarman or an assistant brewer sort of put their final touch on a beer so I think that's where you see it a lot in the festival situation you know breweries like have to be able to turn that beer over quickly because uh, as you're drawing the beer either through a hand pump or gravity or letting oxygen in and in as we all know that oxygen will stale the beer make it cardboardy make it flat so i think it's a great way to see uh quickly see a brewery uh experiment with flavors the wild part is american sours wild yeast those beers can be sour or have any other microflora like brett or things that used to be considered bad things for beer again uh, with brewing technology what it is there are people who just desire these beers more more so over any other type of beer. It's a, if you haven't had one, it's a it's a great little experiment. In flavors, um, Woody would be the barrel age type of beers. You know, traditionally bourbon barrels were uh, the thing that really kicked it off. But uh, we've got tequila barrels, uh, believe it or not, gin, straight up lightly toasted oak, wine, different varietals of wine add different flavors. So those are the constituent parts. Generally, have about 2,500 to 3,000 people there. It's all indoors. And the it, it, traditionally it was in the south hall of the convention center. We're in the north hall. Basically means that we'll be able to queue up before the festival within the atrium there. So that'll be comfortable. We'll have small bites from different restaurants. And uh, we try to bring the outdoors in. So there'll be different campfire games, different uh, vendors that are focused on outdoor lifestyle stuff. And... Uh, just a generally good time. Um, you know, if you're not into those styles, there will be a, a number of uh, breweries that will bring something a little bit more uh, available uh, because there are two functions to this festival. One is these breweries want to show off their chops, uh, but they also have to sell beer that are available. Uh, a lot of these beers are going to be one-off beers, and, and so they'll have a short lifespan out in the market. But in the meantime, they have other offerings. And I think for, for somebody who just you know, really wants all these quirky beers. Yeah, it's a, it's a playground. We'll have the untap list up next week, start to build on it. For those that, you know, maybe want to try some other beers, uh, it's a good launching point. We also have, I think we have cider core coming, so there's some ciders and uh, we might have some other alcohol products there. Uh, but the focus is the beer. The other side of what, what happens at a festival, at least our festivals, is it's a fundraiser. And the fundraiser is for the Arizona Craft Brewers Guild. We do a lot of things behind the scenes. A couple years ago, we passed a bill, SB 1030, which allowed breweries to brew more and continue to have um, their tap rooms and restaurants. Um, so we were competitive with California and Colorado. But I think really the, the thing that most consumers would recognize is that uh, all of a sudden breweries were able to collaborate. Uh, and that was part of the bill is if I own a brewery and, and you own a brewery, we could collaborate on a beer and we could sell it at both places, even if we just brewed it at one place. They can also order beers. Uh, if you remember the situation, you know, 10 years ago, up to five years ago, four years ago, um, you know, you'd hear about a brewery opening and there'd just be uh, a sign saying, coming soon, coming soon, coming soon. Well, generally the hang-up is the brewery side wasn't able to get their licensing or get their zoning or work out any anything with the health department or building codes and all that stuff. But in the meantime, they had this, you know, looks like a fully finished bar and all that stuff. Now breweries open and uh, they sell other people's beer for four or five months. And so we're putting right. money back in their pockets and it's kind of giving them a springboard to success. I, I know there are a few people say, yeah, breweries should open with their beer and all that stuff. Like, well, you know, you're not bleeding money, guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, this is a great program that gets 
breweries open sooner and and you know get the serving side of it dialed in get all their taps dialed in get their pos working uh, get in a rhythm and a groove so when that beer comes online they'll be in in a great spot so you know we need to uh, our fest our festivals the one with the guild seal on it real wild and woody in particular and and strong beer those funds go to making our industry better and and not just the local breweries. We, we run legislative bills and we work with the uh, uh, other parts of the industry to, to smooth out all these little quirky laws and rules that we have to work around. So that's what that money goes towards. So with this being the fifth annual Real Walden Woody, is there anything in the previous four that you've learned or you think you've improved upon? It's, <laughs> it's always nice. you know. I'm, yeah. I'm the kind of guy to where... I somewhat understand the logistics of putting on a program like that. Yeah. And it's it's kind of like, you know, the Catch-22. It's like you can't please all people all the time. And last year, it seems like the two biggest issues that I read about were the line to get in, which, I mean, personally, I thought ran pretty efficiently with the amount of people that went in there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we kept looking to see what the line was at, and it, it seemed to be moving quick. And then you have the people that, you know, show up a couple hours in and they're like, oh, man, all the food's gone. Yeah. What's up with that? Is, <laughs> is there anything that you are keyed in on this year to try to improve or, or you know, one of the things, any any feedback or input sure. that, that you really keyed in on that you're focusing on this year? Yeah. One, one of the thing. there's a couple things that, that we – tend to focus on for our events and that is getting as many people in as quickly as possible. I, I think it's great. We, we, we're held to our own standard and you know when we don't meet it we, we need to do better. Uh, for Strong Beer we, we have the ability to spread out across a lot of acreage to pre-queue everybody up and we've got multiple gates. The convention center has multiple doors as well. However, there, there is a, a lot of baggage involved in running this event with the Phoenix Convention Center. And, and to their credit, they're not used to doing a beer festival. They haven't done one in 30 years. And, you know, if we do it once a year, their teams change and so on and so forth. Not an excuse just laying out the landscape here. You know, they're, they're, uh, we have to work with their team. And um, what that means is we didn't do a good job with that last year. We, we assumed because they had two under their belt that they were going to continue to do a good job. They didn't. Uh, they, they funneled everybody through one door. Fortunately, um, you know, we, we were able to recognize that and, and take take a few people to task and, and, and work through that. But um, the good news is, I mean, that was on our ask list for this year that we not have that happen again. Being in the north uh, side, we'll, we'll have more queue up line area inside, and hopefully that means we can get a lot more people in. In terms of the food, um, you know, I'd love to be able to just do it like our other festivals and have food trucks or have food catering. Um, the unfortunate side is um, I can't even get a price on buying out the contract that ca- the caterers have with the Phoenix Convention Center. You know, they're used to operating business under conventions and, and things like Phoenix. Uh, it's changed its name. It used to be Comic-Con, but it's... Uh, the Comic f- Fest or Comic, something like yeah. that. Yeah. You know? I mean, they're used to doing that kind of a situation where um, they're using their current vendors that are there and, and providing sandwiches and pizzas. And, I, and I actually, I think if anyone's experience with the Phoenix Convention Center is just real wild woody and they see that, that one concession stand with some hot dogs and things you would expect at a ballpark 1970s era. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that that's different from the rest of the convention center where they have, they appeal to different, it's more of a food court. We just can't fold that in uh, because we have to, con- because of the alcohol thing, we can't have people coming in and going out. So we're kind of challenged that way. And um, the compromise is we can give out free samples from restaurants. And, and when I say, I mean free, that, that's restaurants donating that product, donating their time because they want to give you a taste of what, what to expect. It's, this is not a meal replacement plan. <laughs> you know, we tell them what the crowd size is. And, you know, they have a calculation that they do based on, on what to bring. But that doesn't account for someone getting in line three or four times or whatever. So I don't know how much is going to change with that. If, if, if coming to eat and have uh, some beer with it is your primary objective, I would say take care of that first and get there on time. And, you know, I, I, I can't make them bring more food and I can't, I have to use the concession that's available. We tried to work with them to up their game on, and say, hey, these are the, the beers we're offering. Can we work with you on that? It hasn't been easy to get them to even uh, address us. They're just there. And, and they, you know, they say, oh, we didn't make as much money last year. I'm like, well. <laughs> well, yeah, and they're kind of used to multi-day yeah. events and this is one day so 
you, you kind of understand right. the money lost there for them because uh-huh. they're used to like like the comic fest that's yeah. three days but in defense of those like the line for real wild and woody last year you were indoors the whole time you weren't standing out in the sun like if you've gone to any of those comic events, there's guys in makeup and they're sweating their prosthetics off because <laughs> that line runs around the exactly. building. Yeah, it's, and it's ridiculous. The other thing is the biggest complaint about the food <laughs> was the free food. Of course, free food's going to go fast. Plus, you got the the designated drivers. There was a lot of those there because you yeah. do sell a designated driver ticket. Right. So, obviously, they're going to go hang out and try all the food first. Right. Mm-hmm. And honestly... Eat before you go or eat after because yep. you don't have time with all the beer that's there. I experienced all that because you know, last year was my first real Wild and Woody. I'm 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 typically opposed to fests and and big groups of people, and it's not like a mental issue. It's not I, I don't have problems with people, but a lot of the times it's just I just don't go because it ends up being like pandemonium, and I'm not into it. So I, I did both sides. I you know I went as you know I was drinking right. beer, I was experiencing food. My wife went along as a designated driver, and even being there as a podcaster. So, you know, technically, I was working at Real Wild and Woody. So, we're going around, we're doing interviews with, you know, attendees, we're doing interviews with the, the brewers, we're doing interviews with some of the food concessions. And we didn't go out of our way to rush to get this brewery or that brewery or this food or that food. Mm-hmm. I think the longest there was a wait, Hop Dotty was there. Yeah. And they were doing like their little sliders, which are awesome. Big fan of Hop Dotty. So we're like, yeah, we're going to get some sliders. There was nothing out on the table. And we were waiting there. And the people running the table were like, it's going to be like two minutes. You know, they, they had food coming out. Because the way it's all set up, you know, they're not preparing it there on the floor. There's like a kitchen and they have to make so much and bring right. it out. So they had all these runners. And, you know, there's people. It's like, oh, there's no food here. And they this walk is away bullshit. And they right walk here. away. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And people, I, I waited two minutes, which yeah. I don't think is unreasonable. Or, you know, I wasn't like, man, two minutes of my life waiting for this burger. But there wasn't a single food purveyor where I wasn't able to get something. There weren't any breweries where I wasn't able to get, you know, something. there. I mean... I always want to call them the perch, but Ren House was there, and they had like their crazy releases. And I missed a couple, but you know, if you stack up, if if you plan your time right, everyone posts when they're right. going to be releasing stuff. You know, just plan accordingly. If you don't like waiting in lines, get there early. I mean, we got there early. You know, granted, yeah. You know, but when we got there, there was literally nobody in line. So if if, if you hate lines, plan accordingly. Get there early. A lot of people go in and they mingle. You know, there's a lot of people BSing with all the breweries and all that. And, you know, three, four hours, they go to Hop Dotting and find out they're out of burger, free burgers, by the way. And people, like, lose their minds. So, so again, you know, plan accordingly. It's not, you know, total instant gratification. But you, I think you, you definitely get more than the price of admission with this fest. So I got to commend you but guys. But the thing that of that, too. too, is, like, they weren't running out of food because they weren't prepared the food was getting as much word of mouth as the beer was like if you saw somebody with one of those sliders people were asking hey where'd you get that or people were in conversation be like oh you have to go try the food and it's like it was almost as popular as some of the beers there so it's not like Mm -hmm. they just weren't having food ready they were running out because people were running over there to try the food you have to be patient and and again you know it's it's the food if if you're willing to stand in line mm-hmm. to get whatever, you know, your favorite brewery is peddling, the food vendors weren't taking any longer than, you know, the breweries were. So if you if you wait in line to get, you know, a, a small pour of beer, you should wait in line to, to try the food. Yeah, they definitely want to serve you. I mean, they, they want you to have an experience. And so I'm sure they're, they're generally saying, hey, it's going to be a couple minutes or a rod of this, but we have this. But uh, we have more food vendors this year, and let's run through couple of them uh, we've got angry crab that has some gumbo we've got tacos from boulders on broadway pretzel house has some pretzel bites and beer cheese we've got uh, coach's corner providing s- sliders as well as hop dotty again uh, crust is bringing some meatballs copper blues has what they're calling an american sampler what i'm, I'm gonna assume is just a bunch of fried foods <laughs> uh, ever had fried eagle <laughs> american <laughs> Uh, we've got a place called Drivewood has corn on the cob. Uh, Hard Rock is bringing Kahlua pork sliders, and I think they're sponsoring our three bands, uh, which are the Hourglass Cats, the Sugar Thieves, and Matt Weddle. Uh, Mother Bunch is, just has some chicharrones. Hot Dogs has smoky hot dogs. Pick and Pickle has fried cheese curds. 
the perch has beer infused ice cream and Santan has some pastry pairings. So maybe nice. they might be signaling that they're bringing some pastry stouts. I don't know. I'm just making that up. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, the foods are there to be sampled just alongside the beer and the music. And, you know, the, the old model for beer festivals is have tent after tent after tent and people were racing around to try to get, drink all the beer, literally. This is more of an experience. This is, um, there, there's going to be some cool vendors that are there as well. We try to make uh, the inside look like the outside. So there's decorated with trees, which we donate back to the city of Phoenix because we want to preserve Stealing Skill Park. We want to make this uh, a showpiece for downtown Phoenix too. So selfishly, uh, we, we want to be able to show the Brewers Association that the city of Phoenix is a viable candidate for the Craft Brewers Conference that we have a convention center that is beer friendly, that there are folks that know how things work, that it, that we can overcome any legal hurdle, hurdles in terms of serving beer the way that we come to expect serving beer for our events. So, And we want to work with the businesses around us to say, hey, we're, you know, it's July, but we're, we're here and we, we appreciate, you know, that there's more options downtown than there ever have been. Right. So, um, well, I think like talking about like the trees that you donate, like what you won't see at a lot of conventions or even beer festivals is like you dedicated space open space Uh for the trees i think there was like an rv out there and like pick like kind of like a camp set up yeah yeah that that just gave people space like because when you're waiting in line and there's 20 people in front of you 20 people behind you you kind of want to take your beer and just go hang out or your food and you're not really hampered indoor the space was well used last year i mean we have a little bit more space this year and and that is another underlying quality of the festivals that, that the guild does and that is that I don't want I don't want a crowd um, so there might be a lot of people but I, I try to not make it crowded and, and it's hard to predict sometimes where the lines will take and, and, and I have a team of people that just go out there and like literally direct people into line like in a nun and I don't have vests on they're just people that I know like hey if you see a line just bend it around the corner a little bit shape it you know to make sure that people have a way to I, I don't like to be I'm kind of claustrophobic when it comes to crowds like that and, and you know for Strong beer we have 10,000 people and people say oh it's too many people I'm like well you were there what did it did you feel crowded and then generally say no or they might say in this one area I'm like yep we know about that we we you know we've got spotters on that and we'll figure out how to smooth that rough edge out you know we we have now a requirement for our event team to have GoPro cameras on the lines uh, we look at those points where there's too many people it was like Frankly, my name goes on it, and I want people to be safe. You know, when you have that many people, you know, you definitely have to have a different eye for safety and, and, and things like that. So come to have a good time and stay for the beer. Right. <laughs> but I think those lines have a benefit because I think, I think Ren House was one of the most consistently long lines mm-hmm. all day. But the way the line worked is it went right by Crooked Tooth. <clears throat> so people were just getting tasters of Crooked Tooth while they're waiting in line because it was literally right offhand to get beer and it's like yeah it could benefit people are going to overflow into into other beers that maybe they wouldn't normally try or like there there definitely is some market signaling with lines i I think there are some breweries that enjoy that line situation because it it signals something about their popularity hopefully they're not abusing it too much you know to to the completely uninitiated you know that that's oh i must have to go here you know we, we try to keep it to a minimum Sometimes uh, just by having our people work the line a little bit, maybe they'll pick up the pace a little bit. I did have someone say, well, you knew that this brewery is going to be popular and you should put them somewhere else. I'm like, that's not really how it works. <laughs> right. It's really not how it works. Right. I'm not going to be that presumptuous to know who's going to have a big line. And even even based on year to year. To give you an example, I was at the Great American Beer Festival and I, I was there at a particular time and like there was no line for Russian River. There was no line for Black Project, believe it or not. I mean, there was. Crazy. I mean, it, it, it just depends on. It's a little bit like forecasting the weather, <laughs> and we just saw it yesterday with how badly that was done. <laughs> it's like no monsoons today. Yeah, huh? <laughs> what's what's that over my house that I can see from? Yeah, twenty miles away. So are you using Untap like you did at Strong yeah. Beer? Yeah, yeah. There's been a little bit of a holdup because. Uh, I'm trying to drag a master agreement out of them because it's really affordable to do for strong, but less affordable to do for Baja Beer Festival in, down, down in Tucson. So I'm trying to figure out a way to get them on an enterprise agreement type of thing, and I'm supposed to get that pretty soon. So if that happens, I think 
countrywide, you might see more uh, use for in the guild side for using Untapped, and hopefully um, part of that might be more incentive uh, for them to give discounts to some of our breweries. We'll see how that goes. The, the, the demographics when people do use the app, even to look things up, are, are, are pretty valuable to us, and it's a bounce back that we can give to our breweries. Uh, we're always looking at the demographics of things, and, and you know, those things can cost money. We, we, we don't, uh, we haven't seen a anyone canvassing the crowd with a survey. Uh, we did it one year for when we tried to pass the bill. That was, we did, we did, uh, uh, what do you call it, petitions. Like literally, in that situation, people were like thanking us for allowing them to sign our petition. So <laughs> that wasn't a problem. Uh, there people were lining up to sign a petition, you know, wow. um, so for that bill. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 this last week, I don't know if you saw it, the Brewers Association put out some statistics on market by market on craft beer. And um, one of the ones that stuck out to me, because I know we try to pay attention to this stuff, is male to female craft beer drinkers. And in Phoenix, and it wasn't too much different in Tucson, it was 75% male and 25% female. And... You're probably thinking, I've been to a lot of things, but we're, we're more of a balance. Bear in mind, we're talking about the larger market, the people who need it, males and females who don't drink craft beer are part of that survey. What I will tell you is for our festivals, because we uh, take the driver's license data, anonymize it, we don't hit anyone up, you won't get a mailing from us based on that, uh, is that it's 5842. Uh, so females are more represented in our festival environment because I think we provided a different kind of experience than the straight up numbers would imply. So uh, if people are looking to sponsor any of our <laughs> stuff, we can show we, we we are definitely relevant in that growing uh, demographic, which is women. But we we look at those uh, numbers to, to make sure that we are being inclusive, and we the more that we can make our our customers. And, and do our events more look like what Arizona actually looks like, then the better off we're all going to be. So we do that. Again, the proceeds of this go towards uh, a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. The bill a couple years ago was a big one, but we also work with the department, the Arizona DLLC, the Department of Liquor and, and License Control. We have monthly meetings with them to make sure that we understand the trends that are going on in, in enforcement, legal enforcement. We're one of the most regulated industries so we have that we, we we meet a lot to go over with the rest of the industry go over law changes since that went a few years ago we, we, we are an active part of that and so we get little things here and there that, that might not really register on, on people's radar but I mean the whole growler uh, situation where uh, we were able to change the material because it used to be glass and, and time and money I mean we didn't get a lot of uh, resistance to it we had to run down a lot of requests about health and safety and so that went through no problem we we, we allowed restaurants to get a certificate to be able to provide growlers that that helps arizona breweries it helps all breweries I and mean, those are sales that help everybody there's a move to to go to uh, from it used to 40 ounces of beer at one time and that's 50 so that's an extra bottle <laughs> right um, two bombers are an extra bottle um, so small things like that. We, we've got a lot of change coming up in August to allow breweries to service and maintain their draft lines for retailers. That one's kind of complicated in some respects because I think the industry practice is different than the actual law read. And, and so we had to meet with, let me go back. So in a, in a, if, if you're a hoppy craftsman bar, you guys are open now and, uh, and I want to put a beer on. If you're just open, you might not have the piece that goes between the keg and your system keg coupler, mm -hmm. tavern head, those are generally provided by distributors. There was no real accounting for an independent brewery. So if I'm an independently distributed brewery, I show up and there's nothing there, and I might just grab a Hensley or a CC and want to throw it on there, or, or, or I might provide it to you. Uh, the problem is, uh, generally speaking, unless there's a change in the law uh, specifically for it, as a brewery, I cannot provide you something of value because that might be seen as an inducement to put my beer on. And, you know, so... It's like getting into the whole, you know, pay to play. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah, you're following me. So some people are like, oh, it's ridiculous. It's just this, 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 this is small. It's, yeah, but I mean, like, no, it, it, if, if, if it's game on for that, right, then, you know, imagine if I'm at a giant brewery, I'm like, well, maybe I should just supply the entire draft system or their refrigeration or their bar or all their glassware. And then, 
you know, they'd be dicks not to use our right. beer on, you know. Or, yeah. or, or now you, that or, I've done or, that, you have to have eighty percent of our beers on. Or we just say, you know what? Yeah. Gonna pull that all out. See you next week. Yep. That's the inducement part. So any of these goofy things that don't make sense, you have to look at it. If you had an enormous marketing and sales budget, how would you flip that around to your advantage? And that's what we're trying to prevent. Right. So, long story short, is those breweries can legally provide some of those there's a list of equipment that they can replace or provide or service lines again we had to work with the department and say hey this is a this is a problem it'll, it'll affect commerce what are your thoughts on it oh uh, we didn't really look at it but you guys need to change it so we worked with the rest of the alcohol industry retailers the distributors make sure they were cool and we went forward made the law change and so now it won't be a problem going forward because in this case, the department has been really good about working with different industry elements. And, you know, it's a political appointment. Uh, Governor Ducey appointed John Coca, the former Scottsdale police chief, as the director. You know, he can be changed out any time and you might find somebody who just really wants to follow the letter and black and white of the law. And then we'd be having a problem. So fix it now and... Move on to something else. Right. Back to Real Wild and Woody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just... No, no, that's, that, that's good information. That kind of stuff fascinates me. And, you know, I I, le- I read a lot of the articles and, you know, hear about all this kind of shady stuff from Big Beer and mm-hmm. Pay to Play. And, I mean, not just in Arizona, but, you know, all across the country. And it's, it's, it's concerning because, you know, when you have the companies with the deep, unending pockets, who's keeping them from, you know, shutting down all the little guys, all the, all the craft beer guys who don't have the money to pay to play, who don't have the money to buy themselves into a big name bar or whatever to get their product out there. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an ever-changing situation. So. Right. Well, that's the thing. Like it, it dovetails. Like When you buy tickets or talk to your friends about Real Wild and Woody, you're not thinking about what that money is going to to make events like this possible and get better. And like you said... If you had all the money in the world, yeah, you could put the best festival in the world on year after year, but that money has to be put to use, and you can't just please every single aspect of it, because there's right. things you're working towards, and you have obligations, obviously, to the brewers, and to the consumer, and like the convention center, like, there's those things that hamstring you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, case in point is we used to give away glassware to take home with you, and then um, we had that incident where we, we had a, I lobbied to get us to be able to use it on the convention floor, and it went great until the last 20 minutes, and I don't know if people just... There were, there were people who just clearly were throwing their glasses on the ground. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, I said, well, we won't do that again, and we're going to give away the glassware. Well, then we found some of those outside... You know, some of them abandoned, intact, and all that stuff, but other of them um, broken up. I don't have a team to even make a, a, a small perimeter sweep around right. the enormity of what the convention center is yeah. to, to <clears throat> police that in the dark. So, and there you um, have the eighty twenty. You know, you, you, you yeah. you're always going to have those guys. that's like you know, hey, thanks, asshole. You know, you're <laughs> you, you thinking that it was cool to smash, you know, one tiny glass. You know, pretty yeah. much ruins it for everybody in the the years to come. Uh, it's, it makes such a, a noise. It's like a mating call for idiocy sometimes. <laughs> Glad you can handle your beer. No, I mean we want everyone to have a good time, but uh, you know we had it was the case we had uh, uh, at that time we had uh, the silent disco, which I guess is going to be changed to something else. I'm not sure what it is, but you know there were people dancing barefoot and like we yeah. had an injury based on broken glass, and so you know it's it's the case that we're managing a small city. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, and, right. and, and one that... That, that deteriorates <laughs> rather quickly towards the end. Well, <laughs> you know, in, in recent years, I think Strong Beer Fest has, has really come a long way in terms of that. I think part of that was enforcing the tickets and having more uh, spotters to, you know, slow people down. And I think it's gotten better. But it's one of those things, you know, like one of those offensive line things where you no one recognizes it till you give up a sack um it's a situation where people are drinking and and um, we have to try to monitor it there are beers that people don't have a lot of experience with understanding how much alcohol is involved sometimes or i I think there's also a placebo effect 
to if you're switching between different kinds of alcohol or content and flavors. I think, I mean, I, I'll tell you something. I, I, one of my favorite restaurants is Los Dos Molinos, and sometimes I get their chili reno plate and it won't have a drop to drink, and I feel like I'm intoxicated <laughs> when I walk out of it. <laughs> yeah. Get all the um, yeah. in you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we worked with uh, individual police organizations. Uh, sometimes we have the breathalyzers out there, which are very popular, and there are people who line up for that too. Uh, to see where they're at. I think it's good because they it's turn like, it into a competition. Well, n- you know, <laughs> it's an not. education thing too. Um, like. it, they do ask you like what they ask you to predict where you are, and they ask you how, how many have you had, how much, how many ounces, or how many samplers, and, and so that you have a, a frame of reference that could be pretty valuable. I'm not sure if they're going to be out this time or not. I, I should probably check on that. But uh, um, that's the thing, though, with with Arizona. You know, it, it, and you know, everyone talks about legal limit. Arizona is kind of crazy because you know mm-hmm. they have impaired the whole impaired to the slightest degree thing, right. and and that's the thing. It's like you know there's a legal limit, but at the same time, if a cop sees you you know doing some stupid shit in your car or out in public, and they have you blow, mm-hmm. and you know you have any out, you know you may not blow the legal limit, but you know they go to court, and it's like hey, this guy was being a dipshit, and it was because of alcohol. So yeah, he's not legally drunk, but I mean, they can still run you even though you're not legally drunk. Yeah, there was a case a couple years ago back in Mesa where a guy blew 0.0 and they still processed him and he had to go to trial. <laughs> um, I'm confident that he beat it, but I can't say for certain, believe it or not, but he blew 0.0 in Mesa, so there you go. Yeah, we, we, we do have um, you know a great transportation program. We still should have some hotel deals nearby. If you go to realwildwoody.com slash hotels or look at the nav bar on the left. If they've expired, I'm going to have to check on them Monday to, to re-up on them. People are famous for trying to get that stuff last minute. And sure. The hotels want to know in advance that money's coming in. So we'll work that again next week to, to make sure that we have those accommodations. Light rail, obviously. We have a program with Lyft as well. There's some Lyft codes on our on our website. You know, again, people do ask me, hey, what, what beer should I look out for Real Wild Woody? I'm like, if I have time to look for one, it'll be 10 minutes before the festival opens. The breweries do a great job of, of putting together their programs. I'm worried about safety, and I want everyone to have a good time, and I want everyone to get home. <laughs> right. And yeah, that's you know, a nice thing is, like, I live in East Mesa, uh, so it, I think the convention center is 20, 30 miles from my right. house. Mm-hmm. With the discount code from Lyft and the light rail, it cost me eight bucks to get there because I took a Lyft to the light rail. Right, I took the light rail. That ticket's like what three? No matter three what bucks. you do, I mean, if if you stay in the hotel for a night, if you go on the light rail, if you get a Lyft, if you do Uber, I mean, if you get a taxi, it's still cheaper than a DUI. And you know, it, it, there's there's so many different things that a DUI injects into your life that most people. I don't think consider which I mean a lot of people don't consider that stuff when they're drunk but at the same time you know just be responsible you know, the thing that I've learned about fest is you know a lot of people complain after the fact well it's like you know if if you are a huge like Ren House fan mm-hmm. and you know you 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 pray at the altar of Ren House and they can't do any wrong make that be your first stop when you get in the door you know don't sit there and you know bs with your friends and go here there and everywhere and then show up to run house and be like oh i can't believe you guys are out of this because yeah. like you said you know a lot of the stuff is you know it's in a small firkin and you have thousands of people there right not everyone's going to get to try it so you're going to miss out on something i'll just be prepared for that you're yep. just going to miss out on something and and, and um I, I tell you more and more, and I think if you go to enough of these, and if you're in the scene long enough, I go for the people. I go to talk to people that I haven't seen in, in, in a long time, and, and and to get everybody there in one spot is like it's like my birthday party or something. Right. So I go there to talk to, you know, some of the people that when I was going out and drinking and, and standing in line, I, I knew, and um, I go there to talk to some of the breweries that are coming from different cities that I don't get a chance to hang out in. I'm going for that, and um, anything else is just icing on the cake. I mean, to have some great beers and to to learn something. You know, we've got a couple uh, educational seminars going on about uh, flavor pairings, and, and I think we've got a cooking demonstration. I think uh, uh, Campbell from Mother Road is, is going to talk about some of the fermentation process. I mean, just any any little nugget. It's you know, if you look at it as sampling. Like, like if you look at it as a, a free-flowing river, you're not going to be able to capture all the water. 
Right. You're not going to be able to stand in the same part of the river ever. Just just go there and, and, and just take it in and, and understand that a lot of cities aren't able to pull this kind of thing off. Uh, to have these marquee events anymore, it's really to have these number of breweries, the quality beers is really only available to state guilds or regional guilds like San Diego's Guild. And those are the organizations that that money goes right back to the organization. I get nothing against a lot of these other festivals. Some of them raise a lot of money for some great causes, but they're never going to have the scope and the sweep and the enormity that we're going to have. And yeah, I would like to see that because that's a misconception of when you have that little taster glass mm-hmm. and you're walking around and you're like, oh, I have to get my money's worth. And I guarantee if you filled up one or two pitchers, however many ounces mm-hmm. those glasses equal to, and put that in front of somebody and be like, okay, this is an average of 10%, which is probably low for real wild and woody. Right. And put two pitchers of beer and you have four hours to drink this. They'd be like, no way. Right. But when you have that little cup, you're like, I have to run around and drink all this beer. And it's <laughs> like, you're not going to do it. And then you got the alcohol heads who are like, oh, somebody has a 17% beer. I have to go try that one. I don't care what it is. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an experience and I, there, there are people who just want to tick a list, and that's great, too. I'll, t- I'll tell you what we're not going to compete with. We're not going to compete with, you know, people strategically trading beer and ordering beer and sitting at their house, you know, getting online. I mean, that's just, that's a thing. I get it. Um, but this is uh, this is bringing all your friends together and, and meeting new people, being able to get brewers' comments on, on the things that they're offering. It's, it is designed to be there. It is built around everybody's participation. You know, where we fall short, that's where I want to hear about it. Because, like, I want it to be that. I want it to be, like I said, as if, if you look at it as if everyone did this for me. And here I am. And and these are people I know. And and these are breweries I love. And these are ones I want to get to know. That's what we're trying to build. And I think Real Wild and Woody is more accessible to the mainstream. Because all the different flavor profiles. I think Strong Beer is more of, like, kind of evolved into, like, a beer nerd. Almost like a comic fest. I need to go to Strong Beer because the big boys and the big names are going to be there putting their best efforts. And this is more, okay, here's what they're experimenting with. Here's what they're trying that's different. Here's something you're never going to get again. Because, right. I mean, in all honesty, Firkins aren't cost effective. To do that little barrel with whatever adjuncts you throw in there, it doesn't have a long shelf life. Mm-hmm. It might not come out well. They're just experimenting, and it's like, oh, yeah, I had that. And you get to try a lot of different things. And like you said, with the food, I think last year Santan did a jerky pairing with their beers, and that, yeah. that was awesome. Like, yeah. You're not going to get that at Strong Beer because it's right. there. I, I think Real Wild and Woody is definitely more of that something for everybody. You're going to find something that you like there. You, some people don't like strong beers, so Strong Beer Fest turns them off. Plus, it's outside. There, there's no excuse for this. It's, it's inside. Mm-hmm. It's air conditioning. There's all different styles from low ABV to high ABV and everything in between. So I, I think that's why it's really cool. And then you have the whole food aspect. and Yeah, yeah. we got three local bands, too. I mean, and we always try to do it in a way where it's like if, if, if it's not, you know, even if you're, it should be at a volume where you can enjoy it. And if you're not enjoying it, you can take a couple steps one way or another and you're off in another area we don't have the footprint that we do for strong beer so we can't separate areas and and, i mean that's that's what i like about strong it's like literally it's four festivals in one they all have a different character they all have a different look and feel like a long story short festivals that are put on by the guild is we have to create a marketing opportunity for these breweries it's not like any other festival where they're just handing out samples. They, they need to get some feedback on, on customers, and they and they need to... Some of them now are getting savvy about it. They're literally, you know, with a, taking taking stock in who's... They might ask one question, hey, have you been to the brewery before? Yes or no? And they're just tabling that information up because it's valuable information. And they don't do that for a lot of festivals. We give them the, the, the demographic information that's helpful. So it has to be that. Ha- festivals have to be provide some information demographically they have to be fun for the breweries they have to know that all their stuff's going to get taken care of no no issues with uh logistics they should believe in the cause if they believe in the cause i mean that goes a long way you know so they have to have that for the consumer again because we have quote unquote the best beer i mean we could just line up beers and people could just sample them you know and and that's it that wouldn't be very much fun. <laughs> right, I, I mean, you definitely would go through all your tickets, but you would not feel well. And uh, <laughs> I, I, We want people to have a lasting impression of three or four breweries that they already know and three or four breweries that they have you know, no expectations about. Right. 
That's the goal. It's not to go through all 40 tickets or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, um, I, they gave me these tickets. I got to use them. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. Like It was actually, I think, easier to get through the strong beer tickets than it was to get through the real wild and woody tickets last year. Like you said, you run into people and you, you talk and you're talking in line. And you're like, I, there was a couple times before I got drunk that I was in line talking to people. And was, oh, yeah, I got to get a beer. That's what I'm here for. And it's mm-hmm. like there's a... A different social aspect to to these ones and give credit to the guild like you can tell the difference between a guild festival and just a random out-of-state or sure. distributor um, mm-hmm. festival if when you go to real wild and woody you're gonna see people who work at those breweries you're gonna see owners you're gonna see if, if gold if goldwater is there the whole family is gonna be there, mom dad and mm-hmm. and the boys and they're taking time and money away from their brewery to come right. out to this place they're not they're not volunteers they're not group that just signed up to volunteer they're bartenders and brewers mm-hmm. and they a lot of them want to go there to understand and see what's going on with their peers there is some com- competition on that level like there is and that's why by the way occasionally like people say hey the seven breweries don't have beers listed I'm like cuz they're not even telling me <laughs> <laughs> i'm i mean they, sometimes they're trying to dial stuff in at the last minute and sometimes they're just playing their cards cuz they know like we got something here, and, and we're right. gonna blow people away, and they'll uh, they'll withhold it. It frustrates me too. But they're trying to impress their peers too, and and I will tell you, you know, uh, they go, and they they sample, they talk, and you know, I can't tell you how many collaborations come out of some of these festivals. Like, I had no idea you guys were doing this stuff. So it's great on the industry side too. Speaking of industry, the day before this, if people are interested in getting in the industry of a conference before, the day before, it's all day, uh, 7, 27, or July 27th, Friday. It is at Events on Jackson, which is very close to the ballpark downtown and, and not too far away from the convention center. Uh, we have, you know, six sessions of, of brewery technical stuff. And I'll tell you, people, people who are opening breweries are like, oh, I got to do all the brewery technical stuff. Um, there is a whole business side to this, too. And we address that as well. We've got Lester Jones, uh, the uh, the economist from the beer wholesalers and national beer wholesalers uh, association he's going to provide some economic and statistical data to talk about the direction the industry is going and this is going to be more from a distributor's perspective it's it's, it's a perspective that doesn't get heard a lot because i think bart watson on the brewers association size where a lot of people get their statistics with anything i mean there's there's data and then there's interpretation um actually those two get along Famously, comparing notes and, and you know they disagree where they disagree. That's going to be a great talk. Uh, we have the, the um, diversity ambassador from the um, Brewers Association. She's got a really long name, uh, but she goes by Dr. J. And uh, you know I, I've heard her speak. Met her in Nashville. She's she's a great speaker, and it's not you know hey you're doing it wrong. It's it's how can we how can we make craft beer look more like the rest of Phoenix and let's take advantage of these growing opportunities. You know, I feel like I gave you the statistics for men and women. I, I obviously I think we can do better. You know, I think an underserved market here is the Hispanic culture and, and it's it's odd to me I'm gonna draw with a I'm gonna get yelled at probably. Uh, <laughs> you know, very very bold food flavors, not so bold beer choices in that community. So let's flip flop that a little bit. That's an opportunity for us, and, and we can learn more. And, that, and she's just going to lay out the program that we all have to get on board with and develop on our own. We've got uh, Ana de Dazdi, who's worked with Sierra Nevada. Uh, she used to work at Great Divide as a national salesperson. She's going to spend a couple days before this uh, talking to a very, 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 very large brewery that happens to be in town. I won't name. <laughs> um, but that tells you the kind of expertise that she brings to what is you know considered you know the um, somebody who sh- w- people wouldn't think need help right uh, that's gonna be you know interesting because you can talk about building sales teams I mean I know you see sales reps out there hopefully they'll be able to take advantage and this is open to, to you know our out-of-state breweries as well most of our stuff we love to have our out-of-state brewery uh, beer reps at anyway she's gonna be there we've got you know uh, Someone from the Brewers Association again uh, to talk about the the food what is it the Food Safety Modernization Act. Believe it or not, if say Rent House, we keep using Rent House as an example. You're welcome, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> if Rent House wants to get their beer on at Growlers USA permanently because they have more than 20 locations, they have to provide calorie, carbohydrate, fat, everything you see on a on a soup can. Right. 
That analysis costs money, and there are strategies to minimize that cost. But that's something that breweries like Huss have to do, Santan have to do. So that's a cost that the brewery has to absorb. Uh, you know, doesn't get really factored in pricing and all that other right. stuff. Right. So uh, we've got that. I, I, uh, we have a, sort of the elements posted on azbrewcon.com. But if for an all-day conference to be shoulder to shoulder with national and, and local breweries and brewery reps for $125, it's a pretty good deal. Some of these conferences, if you were in another industry, that conference would cost you five, six hundred dollars. Right. And then uh, they put it in some hotel where you have to stay, and we can do that too if you want to pay more for a hotel. <laughs> I got a deal for you. Spend more money. Um, th- this is part the day before that. I can't really talk about it with the general public per se, but if you own a retailer, if you if you own a restaurant or a bar, you've got a free tasting with fifty beer, wine, and spirits, Arizona produced stuff. We got that going on on Thursday, and um, you can get a hold of me at director at craftbeeraz.com if you want to take part of that. It is totally for the industry, but it is there to have people breweries show their stuff and take orders so bring your wallet because uh if you're there and you like something you will be hopefully challenged to 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 make that purchase right then and there and and get a program going of arizona spirits or arizona wines or arizona beer nice so this is this event this consumer event drives that industry stuff that makes us better so like anything there's a lot going on behind the scenes you know that's invested in having a successful if this event's not successful a lot of that stuff goes away we'll have to figure out how to to do better how to figure it out right but, uh, i know you're all going to be there i know <laughs> that we're going to sell out i know that we'll have to t- turn people away let's get this taken care of early so i can sleep better at night i can focus on the actual event day stuff instead of spending time and money getting tickets purchased i mean uh I, i'll tell you like it's that use of 80 20 it's like i spend more money to get those last ticket sales sometimes right. because if i know what my income is going to be i have more liberty to spend more money on extra people and all that stuff but if I don't know you're coming, it sucks. I have to right. I have to guess, right. and I'm going to guess wrong sometimes. Same thing with real well uh, with uh, strong beer. Like lately, it's been misters. It's like big question. When is it going to be? When is it going to be heaters? Because someday it'll be it'll be space heaters. Like right. cancel the misters. <laughs> we need space heaters. What does the farmer's almanac say? <laughs> you know, I should look into that. So that's going on. I'll get to take some time off in August, and then we're back on GABF uh, in September. We've had some great success last year at GABF, uh, World Beer Cup. We've you know got sure. a lot of lot of good Arizona showing. Yeah, no, I'm very excited about it. Also, uh, we've got some food marketing. Uh, excuse me, the, the the Arizona, not Arizona, the National uh, Food Writers Convention here in Phoenix. Not anything that anyone know about but we have to spend time and money on that promoting our products hosting them literally that monday after real long we will we'll be gearing up for strong beer figuring out how we can do better nine acres last year wow huge yeah it was space. yeah it was like huge i remember walking around and seeing that it was like a beach themed area and I was yeah like, i had no idea this was here yeah. until i walked up on it i was I like there's a I whole still, section i missed <laughs> i still remember strong beer fest at mesa amphitheater it's like oh you know, yeah it, it, it was it was tiny and quaint and but yeah it was awesome and it's, it's just it seems to get bigger every year it's not always about getting bigger i mean if we if we don't uh if things change at downtown with their perspective on convention centers if they um there's a whole political side of this too there's a there's a mayoral race and there's a changeover in the in the council people down there and i don't know what the future is of the convention center obviously the south hall was very 1970s and there was talk about revamping that and there's talk about getting rid of it and there's there's a whole thing going on there real wild woody survive it just it, it, it might have to be a smaller event and then there will be less tickets yeah I mean, there'll just be less tickets. It'll probably have to go up in price, too. This is the way we have to... We don't have a lot of control over things uh, at this scale. Um, we're, we can't guarantee 50,000 people over three days. You know? Right. Now you guys you guys are familiar with Lost Lake, right? Yeah, yeah. I got canceled. Yeah, I got year. canceled. So they were like, oh, yeah, they bring... Forty-five thousand uh, dollars people over three days. I'm like, hey, I'm just over here one day, ten thousand, no big deal. <laughs> no one's crying over that, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. That's why there's so many things going on in Arizona yeah. this time of year because it's cheaper. Yeah, yeah. The, nobody wants to be in Arizona because what yeah, today? It's, it's all today. It's, be a, indoors. it's a crisp 114, and technically it's monsoon season, so the humidity is shot up. But yeah, it's it's cheaper. That's why you get things like the Warp Tour in August and right. people. Yeah. 
heat stroking out there, but because it, yeah. it's cheaper. And 74 so. degrees in the guild office today. <laughs> um, what do you guys got coming up? I always feel like we're talking about me and the guild. And No, I mean, you know, the, the hoppy craftsmen, you know, we're... we're Kind of a, it's a slow period, so we're we're looking for new adventures and you know maybe uh, spin up some new collabs with some some breweries. Uh -huh. But uh, for the people who haven't been, what's the best way to get tickets to the convention and to the Real Wall Movie <coughs> Fest? I got two. Uh, well, one thing is going to happen, and by the time this is podcast, you know, be on the lookout for breweries selling guild tickets to Real Wall Movie because we can we can. We can avoid the online transaction fees. Um, basically, if you see me, I will have $50 straight up tickets to this event. So $7 less than list and also no transaction fee. You'll save about 16 bucks. So I guess for history's sake, 8-Bit it will have a number of tickets. Oro has a, has a small amount of tickets right now. I will be expanding the program, but if you see me or if I'm somewhere, I will have tickets and I will sell them to you and, and we will both high five and <laughs> um, that'll be great. But I'm looking to, to uh, uh, have a different event. This this office that you guys are in um, next year for Strime Beer, we'll have a, a live ticket release to sort of, again, get rid of those fees because uh, I hate them, but we'll, we'll do a, a morning event. Maybe we'll have some fun things going on here, stuff that I can't talk about on the podcast, but <laughs> let's build a, a good a base of fans that will be a part of that would be great. But uh, if you go to realwildwoody.com, Real Wild and Woody or Real Wild Woody, we have both, if you're into the brevity thing, <laughs> um, <laughs> that'll get you there. Um, if you, if you, otherwise you're going to have to go through the convoluted PCC uh, system. You'll have to go to the Phoenix Convention Center, tickets, and and have a yeah just go to realwildwoody.com and, and, and get that link that's the way to get them um, but follow along with, along with guild on facebook maybe ask your brewery if, if they'll support a program and just sell some tickets that would be excellent there you go yeah there's nothing convenient about those convenient <laughs> it's convenient yeah. that it's all done by computer now i guess but it's, right but it's some it's getting ridiculous like it'll cost you they're almost in some venues it the convenience and processing yeah. fees almost double the price of the ticket and sure. obviously this isn't that bad, but if you can get them straight up for $50, that's more money to the people who deserve the money, right? Exactly. And, and uh, for the conference, azbrewcon.com, I'll be giving some giveaways to you all. Maybe put on your Instagram and so on and so forth. It's a different ticket than the ones I have, so I'll, it'll be a little bit. We have to get those printed. It's a different process. You wouldn't believe the red tape. No, you just would not believe it. <laughs> it's um, all cool. I mean, we, we had, you know, the folks we got into Strong Beer Fest. I mean, yeah. that, that went really well. People were supremely grateful. That went, that went really awesome. So, yeah. Everything we can do to help. Great. And you can find us online at hoppycraftsman.beer. We're also on Facebook, Hoppy Craftsman, Instagram, Hoppy Craftsman. Um, Ed, who are the raddest people in the world? I'm excited to do this part. So <laughs> the raddest people in the world are the Patreon supporters. Cena Gomez, who happens to be my wife. No nepotism there. Uh, <laughs> San Diego Beer Talk Radio, Mark Bellesteros, Javier Gonzalez, and Phil Mitchell Wall. All right, these are Patreon supporters. They donate cash to us every month. Uh, believe it or not, uh, it, it costs quite a bit of money to run a podcast. So every little bit helps. We appreciate you guys. We appreciate our Patreon supporters. They get um, uh, extra content, uh, some some extra audio that may or be a good be a good or bad thing depending on who you ask. So, uh, Rob, thanks for having us. We look forward to seeing you at Real Wild and Woody. And until then, I'm Jeff. I'm Eddie. And thank you very much. 